said, let's open our Bibles, as I mentioned, to Isaiah chapter 26, and let's go to the Lord in prayer for our time in Bible study. Father, we thank you tonight again uh, for the word that you have laid out so powerfully and wonderfully from so long ago, 700 years before Christ, we're seeing things unfold that are yet in our future that have been repeated over and over again throughout the course of the New Testament, ratified, confirmed, and Lord, with this uh, great distance of time, Father, we see that the accuracy is no less sharp, and Father, we pray that you would cement these details in our hearts uh, so that we would have that same awe and wonder and reverence for your word that the people in the land of Judah that Isaiah was speaking to seem to lack. Uh, Father, we never want to be those kinds of people that diminish our enthusiasm and our interest in what your word declares. And even though these are ancient words, they are very powerful in our lives as well. And so we pray for these examples here tonight to really resonate in every heart. And uh, not, only, not only those in this room, but also those who may be watching online. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, part of the reason we begin every service was worship, and, and that goes for small group settings, uh, as much as we can, as much as are available uh, to have worship leaders. Um, men's ministry, women's ministry, why do we always start with music? Well, some people think that we start with music to sort of warm up the crowd and prepare their hearts for um, hearing the word, those sorts of things. I hear that kind of talk all the time, but that's not it whatsoever. Um, this is called a worship service. Did you know that? This is called a Wednesday night worship service. Who are we serving with our worship? We're serving the Lord with our worship. And Psalm 22 says, yep, yeah, God inhabits the praise of his people. But think about this. God is the inventor of music. He invented the eight-note scale. He invented time and tempo and chord structure and all of the, <laughs> if you're familiar with music and reading music and composing music, then you understand the mathematical basis for music, the tones and the semitones and all the physics that are involved. It's pretty staggering when you really get right down to it. Now, a lot of people from an artist, artistic perspective can sort of skip all of that, and yet that is the basis of it. It's all very mathematical. It's all very anchored in physics. And the audible spectrum and what we hear with our ears and what we're designed to hear with our ears. And, and by the way, the human ear has one of the largest dynamic ranges of any animal in all of creation. We can hear an explosion on one end, and we can hear a pin drop on the other end. Think about that. Think about, and I worked in audio electronics for my sort of secular career, and I understand the difficulty of, of designing a mechanical feature that could both withstand an explosion and hear a pin drop. Do you understand the dynamic range involved there that our ears are capable of? Now, we get older, and uh, our ears start to diminish sometimes in that higher register, but fortunately, our ears never stop growing. And as you look around the room tonight, you'll see on, on the older people, they've got big old ears on the side of their head so that as the high frequencies diminish, the ears get larger to compensate for that. What a God we serve. He's a musical God. We serve a musical God. And every time you go through the Word of God, every time a victory is won, a song is sung. You have the song of Moses in Exodus chapter 15 after they came across the Red Sea and they're celebrating, looking back, seeing Pharaoh's army inundated by the water uh, coming back. We have the song of Deborah in Judges chapter 5. I'm just naming a few. We have Jesus and his disciples. You might not think of that as a song of, of victory. Mark's gospel chapter 14 verse 26, when they had finished the Last Supper, they sung a hymn. Jesus, in their presence, they sung a hymn, went out over the, the Brook Kidron and, and to the Mount of Olives, Mark 14, verse 26. Um, Revelation chapter 5, if you turn there, you know, we, we see this song very often. Revelation chapter 5, beginning in verse 9. This is after the rapture of the church. This is when we are assembled in the presence of, of the Holy One. And Jesus has just been handed the title deed to the earth. And it says, and, they, and that's a great victory, by the way. Amen. And they sang a new song, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. They is we. 
you, you're in this picture. If you want to see yourself in the Bible, you're right here. You're part of this group. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of, of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and, as, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And then in Revelation, um, well, we'll hold on just a second. Let's take a look at chapter 26 in the book of Isaiah. In that day, understanding that whenever there's a victory, there's a song to be sung. In that day, this song will be sung. Now, we just studied chapter 24 and 25 of the book of Isaiah. Hopefully, you were here. If you weren't, you can listen to it online. But we have a picture of the tribulation and the millennial reign in Isaiah chapter 24 and 25. And this is 700 years before Christ, and he is exactly describing the events that will transpire yet in our future, known of as the tribulation, and then the millennial reign of Christ. And here, now, following that great victory, in that day, we read, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. What victory, you might ask? Well, Revelation chapter 16 tells us that when Jesus comes back, Actually, it's Revelation chapter 14. I'm sorry, I misspoke. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 14, it says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of, from the altar, who had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. And then we read in Revelation chapter 19 a further telling of the same story. Now I saw heaven open. This is Revelation chapter 19 verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now, how, how do we know that there are animals in heaven? Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress, as we just read in Revelation chapter 14, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God and he has a, on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all, all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather together for the supper of the great God. We just looked at that last week. That you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their names gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. 
And then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. A great, awesome, mighty victory at the end of the tribulation. Now, Isaiah chapter 26, in that day, in that day, that day is the day that we are describing here. After that victory, in that day, And again, we're in this picture again because we come back with Jesus to rule and reign for a thousand years on the earth. In that day, this song will be sung in Judah. And one of the things that we recognize from this passage, if we haven't already recognized it by the reality of our life with Christ, our life in Christ, our walk as a born-again believer, only total victory brings complete peace. We have a strong city. What makes the city strong? It's the city where Jesus is. And we just read about his awesome power, didn't we? There has been no stronger city in the history of mankind than the city which Jesus has come to occupy, that city being Jerusalem. We have a strong city. There's never been a stronger city on the face of the earth. We have a strong city, that city where Jesus is. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. Then he says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. The world is seeking after peace. Many of you have already discovered that one of the best entrees to presenting the gospel to someone is talking about talking to them about the lack of peace that they have in their heart. Because everybody outside these doors tonight lacks peace. Anyone who is not a born-again believer in Jesus Christ lacks peace in their heart. And even some who are born-again believers in Jesus Christ lack peace in their heart because they haven't totally surrendered yet. And that total surrender is a difficult thing, but the Bible talks about it all the time. And using warfare as an example, only total surrender brings complete peace. Isn't that true? Because unless there's total surrender, there's always an insurgency. And we've seen that, haven't we? We struggled mightily in Iraq with the insurgency. How many of you understand now, looking back historically, that for 10 years after World War II, an insurgency continued and the warfare continued for 10 years until about 1955 before there was peace, before all of that insurgency of Germans had been wiped out after World War II. Have you ever heard that story? People don't talk about that very much. They think that, that once peace was declared, that was the end of it, but it was not. Had the same sort of thing, the same sort of insurgency carrying on throughout that time period that we saw in the nation of Iraq. Only total victory brings complete peace. And and if you're seeking peace in your heart, this is where it's found. And, And I would suggest to you, I would submit to you that everyone desires to have peace in their heart because without peace in your heart, you wake up in the middle of the night and you're thinking about things and your mind is racing and, and uh, you're in the workplace and you're not sure and you're not, nah, 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 nah. you just, you lack peace. And part of what the news media and part of what the entertainment industry does and certainly what the advertising agencies do is try to take away your peace. And they try to deceive you into thinking that if you will only do what they say to do, if you will only purchase the product that they're offering you, that you can have peace. And that's why people buy those things, and that's why people do those things, but it never works because there is no worldly solution that brings peace in your heart. The only thing that brings peace in your heart is absolute surrender to Jesus Christ, to be born again, to submit yourself to his lordship and to his kingdom. Complete surrender is required in order to have complete peace. You see, verse 3 is an awesome promise. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is what? stayed on you every thought every word every deed lord what should i do now lord what should i think about this lord how should i pray 
Lord, I need to know the answer for the situation that I find myself in, whether it's difficult or great. How should I respond, Lord, understanding that, you know, one of the great things about God is that he knows the future. And when you talk to him in this basis, if you are genuinely seeking his will, which is a difficult thing for a lot of people, to genuinely seek the Lord's will, he'll tell you. Now, if your position is, well, Lord, I want to hear your will, and I'll evaluate it once you've told me what it is that you want me to do, that's when he's silent. And that's when you go through what's called a waiting season, a dry time in your life. Because God knows that you're only going to consider what his will is for your life, that you will not immediately respond to him. And so complete surrender is required. Where do we see that? Well, very familiar passages. We read them all the time around here. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 23. You you know where I'm going with this. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And what happens when you lose your life for his sake? You not only save your life, you have peace with God. You have peace with God. Exodus chapter 20, Ten Commandments, really lays down the law about this. And God is informing us for our own benefit, not for his ego, as some might put it. In Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 1, it says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Okay, now, think about that in the life of a new believer. I just brought you out of a lifetime of sin. I just saved you from all that devastation that has always been present in your life. Why are you looking back? Because that was the example of the Israelites. They came out of Egypt and they they kept looking back, and Egypt is a type of sin. I I brought you out of slavery. And whatever sin that you're dealing with is a hard master. That, that Egyptian that was ruling over you, whether it's alcohol or drugs or pornography or anger or whatever it may be, bad attitude, gossip, hard master. Never any peace there. Never any peace there. God says, I I brought you out of the house of bondage. Why would you look back? And then he says in in the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. And that means that you shall not place a God between yourself and the true and living God. And what kind of God would you place between yourself and the true and living God? Well, you might start with yourself. We love to think of ourselves as as God. Um, We make an idol out of ourselves. That's why we're so concerned with how people think about us and that that sort of thing. And we are really concerned, and it's, you know, the same sort of things that we we were talking about on Sunday, this this influence of the world in in bringing this garbage of self-esteem into the church, sorry about that, Um, where people are encouraged to love themselves more. And when you love yourself more, you place an idol between yourself and God because you've made the focus yourself rather than God. And the interesting thing about this is that, and we already know this by experience, you become like what you worship. So when you build an idol, and, you know, we don't have statues and those sorts of things. I mean, some religious circles do. Quite honestly, some of you might have come out of a church system that uh, has lots of idols in their cathedrals and such, and a focus on that. And uh, one of the things that greatly concerns me in this modern age is, is all these movies and television shows that give a visual representation, even if they're doing their dead level best to portray exactly what the Bible says. But then when they depart from what the Bible says and they get all artistic and they start adding to the word of God to make the scenes more interesting or something like that. Well, what are they doing there? And God is invisible and he has plainly said that he doesn't want any sort of visual representation of himself and even these movies and even these television shows that everybody seems so wrapped up in because they are visual. What's going on there? 
who's really behind all that visual representation when God says, I don't want any visual representation of myself. That's what I call idolatry. Because once you have a visual representation of me, that puts that thing between you and me. And you may not even be aware of it. Just a word of warning. You shall have no other God before me. And here he says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, and he's jealous for you. Not jealous in the way that we think about romantic relationships and that sort of thing. He's jealous for you. He loves you so much. I mean, your sin, your straying is going to cost. He knows it's going to cost the life of his only begotten son. And he's going to pay the price for that sin of you straying into a, a visual representation of, of, of whatever it is that you think God looks like or should look like. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of your fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, Jesus reiterated this very point, taking from the Shema, not really given the layout of, of why Jesus responded this way, but he was asked the question, what are the what, are the, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is the, the Shema, the saying is what that means. And the Jews to this day repeat that, that statement. And he said, this is the first and great commandment, which is basically a repetition of the first two commandments in God's law in Exodus chapter 20. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And basically what he's describing there is the two tablets of the law. One side of the, the law is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The other side of the tablet is to love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, you will not steal. You won't commit adultery. You won't covet what they have, those sorts of things. It's all encapsulated there, and it just gets reiterated over and over again. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 says this, and we are talking about peace after all, are we not? And only total surrender brings peace and only total surrender to what the word of God declares. And in Romans chapter eight, verse six, we read, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, back in the Middle Ages, there was a divide that took place in the church. On one side, we had the Reformation, and on the other side, we had the Renaissance. And do you know that uh, for all its faults, the Reformation brought about a following after the Word of God and the Word of God only, and it was very plain. Now, on the other side, we had the Renaissance, which brought about all the visual art artistry that man is capable of, of possibly creating and all these soaring cathedrals with all their statues and all their artwork to draw your attention away from the true and living God or to create the impression. It does do something to your soul when you go into those places, doesn't it? It makes your heart sore. But what is it that's making your heart sore? A concrete edifice? Stained glass windows? God said, I don't even want you to take a chisel to the stones that you make an altar to me by. Just put some big old stones up there. What's important is what's placed on the altar, not the altar itself. What have you brought to sacrifice? Well, one of the things that you bring to sacrifice is this need, this, this fleshy, this carnal desire to have something visual. God said, that's, that's what all the other religions have. They all have a visual. All the other surrounding nations to the, to the nation of Israel, they all had visuals. That's why they, they got upset with the fact over time that they didn't have a king that they could look at like all the other nations did. And they, they went to the prophet Samuel and they said, give us a king, give us a king. We want a king that we can see. And so we read, for to be carnally minded is death. And, you know, by degree, you know, this visual, I mean, what does Peter look like after all? Well, we know what he looks like because we see the statue of him up there on that cathedral. Of course, that statue was created 
800 years after Peter died, and, and nobody brought forward any photographs of Peter, so nobody has any idea what he looked like. But that's what he looked like because some artist created a statue, and you see it repeated over and over again. That must be what Peter looked like. That must be what John looked like. How about this? That must be what Jesus looked like. We all know what Jesus looks like, don't we? Don't we? Yeah, we do, because when I say that, man, an image pops into your mind because we can't get rid of it. We cannot get rid of the visual once it's there. And that visual comes between us and God, and God says, don't, don't do that. So it's almost a practiced art to, to get that, you know, praying Jesus out of your, your mind. See, I, I just did it again. I shouldn't have done that. But I know that you're already seeing it anyway. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is what? It's life and, say it together, peace. You looking for peace in your life? This is where it's found. Um, Colossians, of course, famously says this. Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved... Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also, what, must do. That word must is not really there, but it's even stronger when it says, so you also do. The assumption is that you will. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let, what, the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Thankful for the peace that God gives you. Now, going back to Isaiah chapter 26, we continue reading in verse 4 in a similar way. You know, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is, is stayed on you, fixed on you constantly in your lordship because he trusts in you. Not on, not on pictures, not in statues, not in visual imagery, not in anything that, that even the greatest artists like Michelangelo could, could summon up. Clearly great artists had no idea what David looked like and yet that's what we think David looked like and all that sort of thing. And then he says, trust in the Lord forever. For in Yah, the Lord, is everlasting strength. He's the rock of ages, for he brings down those who dwell on high. The lofty city, he lays it low. He lays it low to the ground. He brings it down to the dust. The foot shall tread it down. The feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. And, and what we see in, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ is that it is not strength that will be rewarded. It is meekness. It is humility. It is submission that will be rewarded, completely contrary to the ways of the world in which we presently live. The way of the just is uprightness, almost upright. You weigh the path of the just. Yes, in the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited for you. The desire of our soul is for your name and for the remembrance of you. With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. When Jesus comes to rule and reign, there will no longer be the ability to learn of wickedness because wickedness will be completely done away with. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? There is a lot of training that goes into wickedness, isn't there? And the examples are all around us. And the allure and the enticement is there constantly. Imagine a world where all of that is done away with. And the only training that's available to you is the training in righteousness. Wow. Wow. You know, this idea of him keeping our minds and our hearts in perfect peace, that's going to be a lot easier in the kingdom. It's very difficult now because we live in this body of flesh and there's this constant warfare going on between the soul and the spirit. 
and the enemy, you know, tempting us, fiery darts and all that. And when Jesus comes to rule and reign, and when we are with him again on the earth, there will be none of that. And all there will be is righteousness and holiness and purity and love and kindness. And that is literally when our minds and our hearts will be fixed on perfect peace. When Jesus returns to rule and reign, peace with God will be easy. Think about it. Since all the threats have been removed. And that's what's being described there in verses 4 through 9. And he says in verse 4, trust, batach in the Hebrew, take refuge is what that means. Trust. And the reality of being certain in your own mind that there is a refuge, that you've passed the time in your life of uncertainty that Jesus is our refuge, even now. And the certainty of his ability and power demonstrated in our lives to meet every need. And when you've arrived at that place, you have found that, that refuge and that's where, when we talk about faith, we're really talking about trust, aren't we? And we're talking about the kind of faith that we build our life, that we stand our life upon, is faith in Jesus and faith in his ability and all of his promises to meet our needs and to always be there. We say it all the time, there's no prison anywhere on the face of the earth that, that can separate you from Jesus Christ. There's nowhere you can go. You can, you can be launched, and, and we've seen it, haven't we, in, in the Apollo astronauts launched into space, orbiting around the moon, and they're talking to Jesus up there. I remember Frank Borman reading from the Bible. That was back in the day. I don't think he could get away with that anymore. But they did then. But the example is, even in a space capsule, I don't know how many thousand miles they were away from the earth orbiting the moon, that they could talk to Jesus. You could talk to Jesus anytime, anywhere, any place, anyhow. He is the refuge that we need. He is the only refuge that we need. He is the only true refu refuge that there is. And once you discover that he is the refuge, once you discover that he is the only refuge, there's peace there. That's called total surrender. That's called complete victory over even the flesh in your life. And the absolute recognition um, when we see that the wicked will be self-destructed in the presence of holiness. And some of you may have already seen that kind of behavior now that, that he speaks of in verses 10 and 11. Let grace be shown to the wicked, yet he will not learn. He will not learn righteousness in the land of uprightness. He will deal unjustly. And will not behold the majesty of the Lord. And then he says, Lord, when your hand is lifted up, they will not see. But they will see and be ashamed. For their envy of people, yes, the fire of your enemies shall devour them. Self-destruction in the, in the wicked. And, and the self-destruction in the wicked is, is the, the fire of God that burns away sin, that, that destroys sin. And the absolute recognition, only Jesus has brought this victory and that we are capable of nothing. Lord, verse 12, Lord, you will establish peace for us for you have also done all our works in us. What a statement. What a truth. O oh Lord, our God, Master is beside you have had dominion over us. Here's, here's the confession. But by you only we make mention of your name. And what we're talking about here is confession and repentance. There, there are steps in, in repentance, understanding that, yeah, we have had a God before you, chiefly myself, me, myself, and I. And I now take that idol and remove it 
in your presence and understanding that we are always in your presence. But prior to that, there, there were times, there have been times when masters beside you have had dominion over us. And that's that, that character, that quality of indecision. Lord, tell me your will, and I'll think about doing what you tell me to do. Or you come across a passage that speaks loud and clear from God's word definitively. You know, there's nothing in here that tells you whether or not to move to Cleveland, but there's plenty in here that tells you whether or not you should move in with your girlfriend before you're married, right? So you get to choose whether you will trust in God's word or not. There's no peace in, in stepping out. There's, you know, sometimes people think about God's will, that's a hard place to live, man. That's a hard place to live. You know what's even harder than living in, this, in the very center of God's will? Living outside God's will. That's a lot harder. That's a lot more difficult. That's when you live under sin, and sin is a hard master. Sin is never satisfied. It always wants you to do just a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. And that's why the wages of sin is death. It's, its only intent is to kill you and destroy you. O oh, Lord our God, masters beside you have had dominion over you, over us, but by you only we make mention of your name. Isn't that interesting? That God is the one that does the work of salvation. We can't save anyone. We can invite them, but only the Holy Spirit can convert them. And so, you know, we talk about having a seeker-friendly church, and we think, well, people are seeking God. Are they really? You get drafted. God draws you to himself. Paul says no one is righteous. No one seeks after good. It's God drawing you to himself. We are all drafted into God's kingdom. We're capable of nothing in and of ourselves. They are dead. They will not live. They are deceased. They will not rise. Therefore, you have punished and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. You have increased the nation, O Lord. You have increased the nation. You are glorified. You have expanded all the borders of the land. Lord, in trouble, they have visited you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening was upon them as a woman with child in pain and cries out in her pangs when she draws near the time of her delivery. So have we been in your sight, O Lord. We've been with child. We've been in pain. And we have, as it were, brought forth wind. Nothing. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall rise. You know, we have that very interesting story in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, after the resurrection of Jesus. You know, after the crucifixion of Jesus, after his resurrection, that the dead bodies arose in Jerusalem and walked in the streets. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verses 50 to 53. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. And now, looking back, interesting how this takes place because we've already been through the tribulation and now we're into the millennial reign and now a, a look back at the end of this chapter a beautiful remembrance of how God spared his church um, we read about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 we just studied this not too long ago on Sunday morning, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read this about how God spared his church from the tribulation, beginning at verse 16 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, indeed they already have. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, 
and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. That that tribulation that's being described, we who are born again, we who are saints in, in the church of Jesus Christ shall not see it. We shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So he spared his church. Again, this is yet future, but Isaiah is looking back to before these events that he's describing here in the, in the panorama of the time of man. He spared his church from this tribulation that was described in Isaiah chapter 24. He also preserved his people through the tribulation. He spared his church from the tribulation. He spared his people through the tribulation. We read about this in Revelation chapter 12. Interestingly, in verse 13, we read in Revelation chapter 12, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman, that's Israel, who gave birth to the male child, that's Jesus Christ. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, three and a half years after the, the abomination of desolation, after the Antichrist proclaims himself to be God at that midpoint in the tribulation when it now becomes the great tribulation. The Jews are to flee, as, as Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. When you see these things happen, hey, don't, don't even go back into the house to get your clothes. Run. Hope, hope it's not on a Sabbath day because they were limited about how far the Jews were, how far they could walk on the Sabbath day. Pray that you're not pregnant or nursing babies, those sorts of things. Great tribulation. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood, probably an army in pursuit of them. After the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Very interesting. Very interesting. Those who come to Christ, those Jews who come to Christ through the greatest revival in the history of mankind during the tribulation, the 144,000 witnesses, very much like Billy Graham's going out all over the earth, the angel declaring the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the two witnesses at Jerusalem, great revival, and God will spare them through the tribulation, and we read, come my people, in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 20, come my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little while until the indignation has passed. What indignation? The tribulation. Remember, this is Old Testament, 700 years before Christ. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. A very clear picture, both of the Lord preserving his church through the rapture and the Lord preserving those Jews who have come to faith in Christ, the true Jews, um, at what is known of presently as Petra, a very defensible position to which the Jews would flee. And in Isaiah chapter 27, we see the destruction of the enemies of Christ and the establishment of his millennial kingdom. Um, verse 1, we read, In that day the Lord with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, of course we're speaking about Satan here in, in pictorial representation. Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. And that's speaking of the Antichrist. Um, again, Revelation chapter 20 is our reference here. And amazingly, how consistently Isaiah is speaking um, that is later on confirmed and, and written again as it was the first time. In Revelation chapter 20, beginning at verse 1, we read, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. 
And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or, or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Those who lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years that are referenced there in verse 4 is this first resurrection that he's speaking of. Blessed is Blessed and holy is he who has a part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Satan is punished. When it comes to the millennial reign, Satan is punished, as we see there, and Israel, Israel is reestablished in that day. In that day, verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 27, in that day sing to her, sing to Israel, a vineyard of red wine, the second coming of Christ, his millennial reign. I, the Lord, keep it. I water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I keep it night and day. Fury is not in me. Who would set briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together. Nothing can keep me from coming to you. Not even thorns, not, not walls, not anything. Nothing can keep us apart. Or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. Those who come, he shall cause to take root in Jacob. We look at the restoration of Israel that took place on May the 14th, 1948. They became a nation in one day, fulfilling the prophecies that have been declared about the land of, of Israel and the people. Those who come, he shall cause to take root in Jacob. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. How could this be in such a desert nation? And when would this be? And then if any of you are paying attention, then you have understood what the people of the nation of Israel have accomplished through the 20th century by planting millions of trees, literally changing the climate, taking this arid desert region and turning it into the fruit basket of not just Europe, but now the world, and raising all kinds of fruit, a chief, if not the only, avocado supplier to all of Europe, and oranges, and apples, and, and all sorts of things, and dates especially. All of this literally being fulfilled in our lifetime. He has struck Israel, has he struck Israel as he struck those who struck him? Or has he been slain according to the slaughter of those who were slain by him? thinking about mourning for those who will not accept the crucifixion of Christ. In measure, by sending it away, you, you contended with it. Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 30, those who are not with me scatter. You have to make a definitive decision to be for Jesus Christ. In measure, by sending it away, you contended with it. He removes it by his rough wind in the day of the east wind. Therefore, by this iniquity of Jacob, by this, therefore, by this, the iniquity of Jacob will be covered, and this is all the fruit of taking away his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altar, like chalk stones that are beaten to dust, wooden images and incense altars shall not stand. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you when you get rid of all that stuff. Yet the fortified city will be desolate, the habitation forsaken and left like a wilderness. Speaking of the destruction of Christ's enemies, there the calf will feed and there it will lie down and consume its branches. When its boughs are, are widow, withered, excuse me, they will be broken off. The, the women will come and set them on fire. For it is a people of no understanding. When Jesus comes back, Jesus foretold this in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, 
that on his right hand would be the sheep and on his left hand would be the goats. And this is that judgment that's being spoken of here. That these people that have chosen volitionally, purposely, willfully not to understand. Therefore, he who made them will not have mercy on them, and he who formed them will show them no favor. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will thresh, speaking of this very judgment, this division between the sheep and the goats, the Lord will thresh. Jesus talks about it again. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, verses 31 through 33. Daniel's Gospel, uh, not Gospel, but Dan the prophecy of Daniel refers to this, and we'll get to it when we get to Daniel chapter 12, talking about the length of days uh, of the second half of the tribulation. And, and then blessed are those who come to the end of 1,335 days. So apparently there will be 45 days of judgment, three and a half years, 1,290 days. And then in this prophecy of Daniel, we read, blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. 45 days of judgment between the sheep and the goats, apparently when Jesus Christ comes back to rule and reign on the earth. And you will be gathered, he says, from the Lord's threshing, from the channel of the river to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered one by one, O you children of Israel. So it shall be in that day, the great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria. Very strange. And they who are outcasts in the land of Egypt. Very strange. And what will they do? When Jesus rule and reign is, is established on the earth. They shall worship the Lord in the holy mount of Israel. And, you know, remembering the context of when these prophecies were offered, Assyria is at the gates. And here is Isaiah giving out these prophecies, beginning in Isaiah chapter 13, running through chapter 23, with prophecies about the doom of those nations, not only the nations of Assyria and Babylon that would conquer the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah respectively, the condemnation, the judgment of God on those nations, but also the judgment of God on all those nations surrounding the nation of Judah that they might be likely politically to turn to to seek refuge in or to seek help from to defend themselves against the Babylonians and against the Assyrians. And God's saying, no, I'm, I'm going to wipe out all those nations. Don't depend on those nations. But I'm going to bring you through this. And the proof that I'm going to bring you through this is the fact that I'm giving you these prophecies through Isaiah. And he's telling you about your long-term future. Long-term. Thousands of years in the future. And when God speaks about thousands of years in the future, he's giving you certainty in your heart that your existence is guaranteed. Amen. Guaranteed. No matter what you see at the gates. And we remember that part of that prophecy was a, sort of an, an odd statement in Isaiah chapter 19. Perhaps we remember, but if you don't, I'll just refer you to this verse. Chapter 19, verse 25 I'll read verse 24 for context. In that day, speaking of this very word that's offered here in verse 13 of chapter 27, in that day, Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria. What? A blessing in the midst of the land whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. And now we see that, again, confirmed in prophecy, looking to the future. So it shall be in that day when the millennial kingdom is established. The great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria, and they who are outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem thinking about those people that are at the gates right now. And, and again, we've never, we've never faced an enemy like that. In the United States, all our enemies have, have always been, they've either been way over there, or now we're facing the greatest enemy we've ever faced, which is the enemy within. 
but we've never faced an enemy like this, an overwhelming, overpowering army that has come to destroy and to fillet and to knife babies out of mother's wombs and, and those sorts of things, the, the absolute destruction that awaited them at the gates, this, this army, this threat, this power of Assyria come down, sweeping through the land, already having captured some 50-odd cities in the nation of Judah, Jerusalem being the lone remaining city of any value to be captured. And the people are just dumbstruck with fear and trembling, and God brings forth this series of prophecies through Isaiah and through his Holy Spirit, telling them, no matter what enemy you face, I'm on your side. I'm on your side. And even with, as we will see in the next chapter, even with everyone, the, the great majority of people turning away, I'm going to bring a remnant through all of that. And Israel will be restored. And not only will Israel be restored, but all the nations of the earth shall come to Jerusalem and worship the Lord of hosts. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your, the sure word of prophecy. Lord, we revel in the fact, we enjoy the fact that the Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of prophecy. And these things stir our hearts because we can see these events in our mind's eye in the way that you desire that we would see them with our imagination. We don't need a visual representation of this. We don't need a movie made about it in order to understand it, Lord. You've given us your word and you've told us that your word is true and you've stirred our hearts to understand and comprehend the fullness of what all this means, even if we don't. That there's something going on with the power of your Holy Spirit and it's called revelation and we enjoy it. We thrive from it. We go from this place having our hearts stirred by the power of your word and understanding what was declared by, by Paul, that, that the word of God is, is profitable for reproof and for correction. Lord, we didn't come here tonight satisfied with who we are, where we are. Lord, we came here tonight to be corrected and to be set free from the bondage of, of sin. And what a joy it places in our hearts to know that with total surrender, with complete victory, comes peace with God, peace of mind and heart. And as I referenced earlier, as we continue an attitude of prayer, if you lack that peace of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you can remedy that right now. I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. And I know that the Holy Spirit has already informed you of everything that you need to know about this very thing that I'm describing right now, so I don't need to talk about it a lot. You know what your need is. You know that you lack peace in your heart. You're just like the people out in the world and your religion. Attending church hasn't gotten you anywhere at all. It's only through complete surrender. It's only through total victory that Christ has our hearts and gives us that perfect peace that we seek. Pray these words with me that you may have that perfect peace that begins with confession and repentance and follows through into conversion and salvation. Lord Jesus, I open my heart and I invite you inside to be my Lord to be my God, to be my Savior, to be my friend. Wash me clean, I pray, of all my sins. For I have decided this night to follow you, Jesus, forever and ever. And I really mean it. In Jesus' name I pray.